Greetings, my fellow freedom lovers and sovereign thinkers. Thank you for tuning in to the LL3 Podcast. My name is Craig, transmitted from the beautiful Swampy Man in South Florida. And today's date is Sunday, January 3rd, 2021. Yeah, I gotta be careful when I say about the years, because I may get uh, a little bit confused. But uh, it's all well and good. It's early Sunday morning. You might hear some music in the background along the New River. And it's pretty peaceful right now. People are strolling by. If you, usually if you hear people bickering, they usually came from the jail. But it's um, all well and good. Yeah, so I'm going to be uh, discussing, narrating a few articles, a couple of articles. And pertaining to Assange's uh, extradition case and powers that could, uh, natural powers within us that could change, that could... Uh, Resurrect our world, I would say. Yeah, but um, it'll be mainly a couple commentaries. So it's um, you know, always uh, like to do these things because sometimes they're very merited and it gets people to think, including myself. So I'm gonna do one right here from Consortium News, and um, this is entitled "What Would." happen if there's a split decision in this Assange case. It's written by Alexander Makoros. Actually, he does the, he's an editor for the Duran. And I'll be honest, they, they're a pretty cool site. You should support them as well. So, um, let's just see what he has to say here. What would happen if Magistrate Vanessa Barrister renders a split decision on the Julian Assange extradition case on Monday? Ask Alexander Makoros. One possibility that must be considered in the Julian Assange extradition, extradition case on Monday is a split decision in which Magistrate Vanessa Barrister, Barrister may decide to extra, extradite Assange on one indictment, but not on the other. For instance, she could rule for argument's sake against extradition on the Espionage Act charges, but in favor of extradition on the conspiracy to commit computer intrusion charge, which carries a maximum five-year sentence, as opposed to 170 on espionage. What would likely happen in that case is that the British authorities would accept Barry Sturr's decision and would try to reach an agreement with the U.S. Department of Justice, whereby, in return for Assange's extradition, the U.S. will commit itself to try Assange only on the computer intrusion charges and not on the espionage charges. The British, over the course of the negotiations, would tell the U.S. that if the, U- if the U.S. are not willing to give that commitment, then the British would not be able to extradite Assange to the U.S. Of course, the British, if Assange were extradited, extradited, to the U.S. on such a basis, would it be in no position to compel the U.S. to abide by such a commitment if the U.S. were on, were go back on once Assange was on U.S. soil? Since there has to be a very likely possibility, one would like would think it would be able would be excuse me would be a point which Assange's lawyers would make it in the appeal that they would be bound to make to the high court against Barry Sturr's decision. In fact, in such a scenario, it's not possible that both sides would appeal to the high court. One, the U.S. against Barry Sturr's decision to refuse to extradite on the basis of the Espionage Act, which is unconstitutional, okay, totally illegal. Two, Assange's lawyers against Barrister's decision to extradite on the computer intrusion charges. It would be a fascinating battle, and it would be fascinating to see how it would be would play out. Logically, the balance ought up ought to tip in Assange's favor, since Barrister would presumably have rejected extradition on the Espionage Act charges because they were not properly made out and because they were overly political. In the light of that, 
would be the, would the high court be prepared to allow Assange's extradition on computer intrusion charges to a country which had tried unsuccessfully to bring over to the political charges against him, which the lower court had rejected? Nothing is predictable in this case. He's absolutely correct. And I just hope it will be all, it will all be rejected, period. There's another chilling chapter on the war on the press, regardless. I find it very disturbing indeed. I'll say it once again, whether you like him or not, he could be an arrogant jerk. But when it comes to freedom of the press, you got to stand by its principle, his principles, including WikiLeaks and anyone else that try to bring truth to light. And this is why when he, when he had charges filed against him by a grand jury, I'm not afraid to criticize William Barr and the lackeys in that particular institution. People need to stick together. This is a global issue. Not just within the United States, but worldwide. If they, and I, I can tell you, this, if they do any extra, extradite him, he'll be tried, expect him to be tried in Arlington, Virginia, which a lot of people in the jury pool work for the federal government. Call, talk about partiality 101? Absolutely. Well, we'll have to wait and see. I know... Um, Consortium News is going to be doing a live feed, 6 a.m. Eastern Time. So I think it'll be like 11 or 12 in um, 11 or 12, I guess, in, in Britain. This is really essential, and hopefully, it will be tarn. Um, I would say tarnished completely. So put your thoughts and prayers for this gentleman and anyone else. That is liberty-minded, pro freedom of the press, etc. So um, enough that on that aspect. But I'm going to do one more here, which is very interesting. We have in our power to begin the world over again. It's by Michael Bolton from the Tenth Amendment Center, and um, it was done Friday, this past Friday, January first. And I haven't done. It done anything on the site for a while which I should try to do it more often but so much information out there I just randomly pick and choose and ooh, take it from there it says here in the appendix to common sense the first published on January 10 1776 Thomas Paine wrote about the birthday of a new world with this timeless reminder that fits today and every single day of the year that's here. Quote, we have it in our power to begin the world over again. Unquote. With that reminder as our foundation today, I want to share with you nine more of my favorite quotes from, Lent, from leading founders that set the stage for how we're approaching things in 2021 and beyond. I present them without commitment. The wor words speak for themselves. Number nine, Richard Henry Lee, elective despotism. I suppose, my dear sir, that good people of the U states in their late generous contest contend for free government in the fullest, clearest, and strongest sense. They had no idea of being brought under despotic rule under the notion of strong government or in form of elective despotism, chains being still chains, whether made of gold or iron. That was a letter sent to, sent to Samuel Adams on October 5th, 
1787. And there's a podcast link below to check it out. And don't worry, I will put both these articles on my Spreaker page and you can check it out yourselves. And number eight, James Otis Jews Jr., Prudence. When our rights are invaded, it is a high time to throw aside prudence. And believe me, my countrymen, he is not worthy your suffrages who on such an occasion would prudently would it prudently resign them for the sake of peace. He that is afraid to speak his mind and is for suffering injury, injustice, or oppression rather than disturbed public tranquility or more probably dangerous security it is not to be confined, confided in. For it always safer to oppose any the least infraction of our happy constitution than prudently to equisis for the preservation of peace. That's from his writings on a freeborn American on April 27, 1767. Merited on that one, right? Very merited. A la COVID-1984. Think about that. Number seven, George Washington, your patient. And it says here, let it be, let there be no change by your patient. All right. For though this in one instance may be the instrument of good, it is the customary weapon by which free governments are destroyed. The president must always greatly overbalance and permanent evil any partial or transient benefit which the use can at any time wield. Yield, excuse me. That's from his farewell address on September 19th, 1796. And there's a video and podcast on this. So check it out. And I, I did, and I have done a uh, episode. I had, I, I did in the. Uh, to a uh, two-part series on George Washington's farewell address, like many, many years ago. Just type, look, let's type it in under my uh, speaker page. You'll find it. So, in number six, Theophilus Parsons, justif- justified in resistance. The people themselves have it in their power uh, effectually to resist usurpation. Without being driven to an appeal to arms, an act of usurpation is not obligatory. It is not law, and any man may be justified in his resistance. Speech in the Mass, Massachusetts Ratifying Convention, which happened on January 23rd, 1788. Of course, there is a video and podcast, which is entitled, How to Deal with Unconstitutional Acts. There's a link for it. The people should know about that. What's going on now, right? Absolutely. Number five, James Aradell, inherited right of the people. Abuse may happen in any government. The only resource against usurpation is the inherent right of the people to prevent its exercise. This is the case in all free governments in the world. The people will resist if government usurp powers not de- delegated to it. That was a speech he did in North Carolina's ratifying convention, which was on July 29th, 1788. Patrick Henry Trust. Show me that age and country where the rights and liberties of the people were placed on the sole chance of their rulers being good men. Without a consequent loss of liberty, I say that the loss of that dearest privilege has ever followed which absolute certainty every such mad attempt out of the speech he, speech in the Virginia ratifying convention June 5th 1788 so what he is saying he's one of the men say you never trust the government think about it folks being a yes person a Karen an informant a snitch a delegated House and field peasant doesn't get you anywhere. Okay, doesn't get you any hop, any fidelity. Number three, Samuel Adams, defending freedom. The truth is, all might be free if they valued freedom and defend it 
it, defended it as they ought. That's an essay in the Boston Gazette, October 14th, 1771. Of course, there is a video and podcast on this, American Independence. Number two, should an unwarrantable measure of the federal government be unpopular in particular states, which would seldom fail to be the case, or even a warrantable measure be so, which may sometimes be the case. The means of opposition to it are powerful at, at, and at hand. The disquietude of the people their repugnance and perhaps refusal to cooperate with officers of the union, the frowns of the executive magistracy, magistracy, magistracy of the state, the embarrassment created by legislative devices, which would often be added on such occasions, would oppose in any state very serious impediments and were the sentiments of several adjoining states happen to be in the in union would present obstruction what the federal government would hardly be willing to encounter. Fellas Papers 46, 29th of January, 1788. And there's a video podcast on that as well, How to Stop Federal Programs. I always encourage folks too, to read the Federalist and any Federalist Papers as well. And number one, Thomas Jefferson. A fee people claiming their rights as derived from the law of nature and not as the gift of their chief magistrate. A summary view of the rights of rich America, 1774. There's a video podcast on that too. Thomas Jefferson's vision. It's all linked. You can check it out. Very good stuff. And here it is. As we kick off the new year, we're rolling up our sleeves every single day to take a stand for the Constitution and liberty against the largest and most powerful government in the history of the world. Getting the job done won't be easy, but no matter what the odds, it is essential to do what's right. And for us at the TAC, that's the Constitution. Every issue, every time, no exceptions, no excuses. Together with your help, we'll continue setting the foundation for liberty in 2021 and beyond. Thank you for being here with us. Definitely, folks. Another great organization to to, um, support one way or the other. I've been following these guys for at least a good 10, 12 years. A little bit more, maybe a little bit longer. I always enjoyed their um, content. It's educational and gets people to think. The fact is this, folks. We've been like, been subdued or the subdued or stagnate on our natural obligations as Americans. Doesn't matter what your race, color, creed, national origin, etc. Our rights are natural born. They are inalienable, or as pronounced originally, but inalienable, just to give you a context, a little more clarification. And one of our main duties is never trust the government. You got folks out and about, even down here, believe government knows best. It's purely unacceptable and tyrannical. I'm not afraid to call these parasites out. I do it all the time. And they get so sensitive, that don't bother me one bit. I don't get mad at these ingrates, but inspired. And every one of us can do that. And what we're seeing right now is a huge awakening. The world is watching us as we speak. And screw the left-right paradigm and the propaganda media trying to tell us what's right or wrong. 
everyone out here can contemplate for themselves. We have that gift. And I endorse, recommend everybody to get proactive at the best of your ability with, with, on what avenue you pick is your choice as long as you don't violate others. And this is why even with this Assange extradition case if we let this go it's a president create a president that will be a put a burden on any of us or all of us. The ripple effect. Stand your ground by exercising liberty to the fullest. And you teach this to your loved ones, children, neighbors, etc. Even your enemies. And I say that in good faith. And that will be it. I thank everyone for listening. Plus, feel free to download and share this throughout your social media networks. If you have any questions, comments, maybe send something that's interesting you want to check out, whatever you do, please send your correspondence to the quorum. Furthermore, I will leave the footnotes of these articles within on my speaker page. If you want to contact me, you can hit me at lokiluck number three at gmail.com or lokiluck number zero three at protonmail.com. If you don't do a donation, give me a paypal.me and cash.app forward slash Loki Luck number three. Support, um, send, send your financial support to the Consortium News, the Duran, the Tenth Amendment Center. That would be greatly appreciated. Once again, thank you for your time. Plus, always remember that the maniac resistance is healthy for the soul and can liberate humanity. Until next time, take care of yourselves. Keep on spreading the love, and may your guardian spirits be with you.